True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to another episode of True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Morano. And as you know, June is Pride Month, and so this episode of True Gay Crime is solely dedicated to just that. A very special Pride Edition episode about the origins of Pride and one of the key figures present during this time, Marsha P. Johnson. She was an American gay liberation activist, self-identified drag queen, and a prominent figure in the Stonewall Uprising of 1969. Ladies and gentlemen, I am ashamed to admit how little I knew about Stonewall, what happened during that time, who Marsha P. Johnson was, who her friend Sylvia Rivera was. It's just so sad that this the information is there we just do not pass it on to each other this is our history this is so important for us to pass down these stories they should 100 percent be teaching this in school this is imperative that everybody knows it's so fresh rights are still being trampled on And especially what's happening in countries where everyone looks up to, like the United States, where the Republicans just take away rights left, right, and center of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, everybody that belongs to the community. And it's so important to continue to remember the history and to tell these stories. So that's what this episode is all about. Marsha P. Johnson was known as the Saint of Christopher Street. This, of course, was a street where Stonewall Inn was based, where it was located, and her endless compassion and care for her community has made her a beloved figure for countless LGBTQ2 plus people. My sources for this story were Wikipedia for Stonewall, Marsha P. Johnson, Stormy de la Revie, and Sylvia Rivera. The bbc.co.uk, usatoday.com, wuwm.com, mirror.co.uk, and esquire.com. Because you know what? There's a lot of information, and I pulled from a lot of different sources. So, let's dig right into the story of the birth of modern pride as we know it, and one of its key players, Marsha P. Johnson. Marsha is born Malcolm Michaels Jr. on August 24, 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He has six siblings. His father is an assembly line worker at GM. His mother, Alberta, is a housekeeper. The family attends church regularly at the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he stays religious his entire life, even having an altar at home with saints. By five years old, he starts to wear dresses, but of course he's teased by the local boys and he goes back to dressing just to fit in. At 13, he's sexually assaulted by another adolescent boy, obviously too young to process it. Malcolm would later say that the idea of being gay was, quote, some sort of dream rather than a possibility. And he stays away from sexual activities. After all, his mom tells him that being homosexual is like being, quote, lower than a dog. After finishing his education at Edison High School in 1963, he packs a bag of clothes, grabs $15, and heads to New York City. He sets up shop in Greenwich Village in 1966 and gets a job waiting tables. He starts to make friends with street hustlers who hang out near the Howard Johnsons at 6th Avenue and 8th Street, and this changes the direction of his life forever. After years of pretending to be someone he isn't, Malcolm gets to express himself in the ways that make him feel whole. Over the years, he identifies differently, sometimes as gay, sometimes as a transvestite, which... Okay, we're going to have to talk about this tra- this term transvestite. The definition, according to Google, is a person who dresses in clothes primarily associated with the opposite sex. Now, there are debates as to whether or not the word transvestite is offensive or not. Those that say it is offensive is because it's a use it, it was used as a psychiatric term for crossdressers which were deemed heterosexual men who got a thrill out of dressing up in female clothing. 
and they say the preferred term here is just cross-dressing. Since for the majority of cross-dressers, it's, about, it's not about sexual pleasure, whereas historically it was for transvestites. Those who are okay with the term say that transvestites are just people who like to cross-dress and that they are pretty interchangeable. So, in Malcolm's time, it's commonly used, the term transvestite, but today, to say transvestite is considered outdated and derogatory. So, best not to use it now. Malcolm also identified as a queen, like drag queen or street queen, and according to Susan Stryker, who's a professor of human gender and sexuality studies at the University of Arizona, says that maybe the best label, if we have to put a label on Malcolm at all, personally I hate labels, but they do come in handy, if we had to put a label on Malcolm, it would be gender nonconforming or transgender, but neither of those terms were really used back in Malcolm's time when he was alive. Okay, so with the knowledge that she is said to have preferred to use feminine pronouns, I'm going to start using the she-her pronouns moving forward for Malcolm, and we're about to switch up her name. At first, she goes by Black Marsha, but later she changes it to the name we all know her by today, Marsha P. Johnson. And get this, the P (laughs) stands for Pay It No Mind which is what she tells other trans folks when they are harassed. If they're harassed, she tells them, pay it no mind. And the Johnson comes from the restaurant Howard Johnson's on 42nd Street, where she could often be found eating. So it's about this time that she's living on the streets, and she engages in what we call survival sex, which is sex work to survive. She would go on to be arrested, she claims, over 100 times, shot once, and suffers a mental breakdown. But for now, she's just Marsha from the block. And as for her style, Marsha is not what we would call a polished queen. I mean, due to the fact that her entire life, she barely has two pennies to rub together. She couldn't buy nice clothes or even nice fabric to make clothes. Instead, she spends the night sleeping under tables in the flower district in Manhattan, where workers would sort flowers and drop the leftovers on the ground. She scoops up the leftovers and she forms a crown on top of her head with. Marsha's a tall lady, she's thin, and she loves to wear flowing robes and shiny dresses with red plastic pumps and brightly colored wigs. Needless to say, she rarely goes unnoticed. So, now that we have an idea of who Marsha P. Johnson is, let's get some gay history going here and learn about the struggles of the LGBTQ2 plus community in New York City in the 20th century. After World War I, when the men and women come home from war, they take the opportunity to settle in some of the country's bigger cities. Greenwich Village and Harlem become two popular spots for gay men and lesbians during this time, so much so that a newspaper story covers it, calling them, quote, short-haired women and long-haired men. And during the following decades, distinct communities are formed. Then comes prohibition, which doesn't really affect the gay places because If you're gay, you've been forced to hide most of your life anyway. Um, And New York City passes these laws banning homosexual activity in public and private businesses. So gays are banned. Booze is banned as well. And both are considered immoral. And so both are now underground. So speakeasies pop up everywhere. Because who's going to stop drinking just because you tell them to? No one. I mean, I wouldn't. I have a martini right beside me right now. Can you imagine trying to do that today? Prohibition, I mean. I mean, like, we've got these Karens during the pandemic not wearing mandated masks in public, complaining about their freedoms and not caring about other people's health or the the health of the communities. Can you imagine telling them that they can't drink? I mean, oh, my God. No, Karen, you can't drink. No, booze is illegal. Oh, my God. The, the pushback. Anyway, back to speakeasies. Um, speakeasies become impromptu places to drink they were everywhere and they moved around so the police can't keep track of them but they try and there's police raids all the time they close iconic places like eve's hangout in 1926 which i googled eve's hangout was a new york city lesbian nightclub established by polish feminist eva kochever in greenwich village lower manhattan in 1925 this sounds like a fun place i would have gone to eve's hangout for sure Over the centuries, the gays have mastered the art of flying under the radar, as you know, to survive. And during the 1950s, it got really bad. There's a social repression that forces a cultural revolution in Greenwich Village. Part of that revolution is a group of poets called the Beat Poets. Now, the Beat Poets, that name, it evokes 
weariness and down and outness, the beat under a piece of music and beatific spirituality. And a couple of these poets you may have heard of before, because I had certainly, although I don't know much about them, again, bad gay, um, a guy named Allen Ginsberg, and then one called William S. Burroughs. Both of these guys lived in Greenwich Village, and their art attracts sympathetic liberal-minded people, including the gays, who are drawn to the idea of questioning norms, of course, consumerism, yes, and closed-mindedness, always. Then, as New York City is getting ready to host the 1964 World's Fair, the asshole mayor at the time tries to get rid of all the gay bars because he's worried about the image of the city. So they take away the liquor licenses of all the gay bars, and undercover cops go into the bars to trap gay men doing illegal stuff so that they can put them away. Okay, I have a real problem with entrapment. I feel like that is... It shouldn't be legal for you to trick someone into doing something that's considered illegal. Like, how can that hold up in court? Like, you tricked me. You pretended to be offering me something. Drugs. Selling me drugs or hookers or you're grabbing your cock in the bathroom or something. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, you put the idea in my head. Maybe I was just minding my own business and then I was like, oh yeah, actually I would like a gram of Coke. That does sound pretty good right now. How much are you selling it for? Oh, you're under arrest, sir. Wait, what? (laughs) Fuck you. Like that is the word. I hate entrapment. I can't, I can't even handle that. Oh, okay. So an example of entrapment is usually considered an undercover police officer who found a man in a bar or a public park. He engages him in conversation. And if the conversation heads towards the possibility that they might leave together or the officer, um, you know, buys them a drink, then he was arrested for solicitation. I mean, okay. Another example. There was a story in the New York Post described an arrest in a gym locker room where the officer grabs his crotch, moaning. And then the man asks, are you okay? And then he's arrested. Few lawyers, of course, want to defend cases as undesirable as these. And some of these lawyers kicked back their fees to the arresting officer. Let's talk about the Mattachine Society. Now, they were founded in 1950, and it was an early national gay rights organization in the United States. Like, it's one of the very first. So, The society gets the asshole mayor of New York City to stop the campaign of closing gay bars. So the bars are now open. However, there's no booze because the laws allow the liquor authority to approve and revoke liquor licenses at will. Bars were really like the only places for gays and lesbians to meet in this time. I mean, I'm oversimplifying our community, by the way, by just saying gays and lesbians just to save time and like, you know, instead of just running through the whole alphabet, but I mean the entire rainbow of people all across the spectrum of all colors, shapes, sizes, orientations. Also in those days, the terms, as we heard earlier with transvestite, were different and they don't fit in with what we use today. And so I try to include every single person every time I say gay. So when I'm saying gay, I mean everybody in our community, okay? This pos- <laughs> Because if I don't, this podcast is going to be 20 hours long, so... The only place that gay people have to congregate in are bars. And there are tons of gays in Greenwich Village, but the bars are actually the only place that they can meet and hang out without being harassed or arrested. And none of the bars are owned by members of the gay community. They're all owned by the mafia who pay off the police to leave them alone while they treat their patrons badly They water down the booze, and they overcharge for drinks. (laughs) I don't know if I hate the mafia for this or I love them for this because I'm really torn. Because on one hand, they gave a place for gay people to congregate and drink and dance and have fun and be themselves. But you know they hated the fucking gays. You know they hated them. They were just super capitalists, and they just saw an opportunity. So they're like, the mafia, I mean, it's all about money and power and They're just businessmen. They're just like, let's open. This wasn't about, oh, equal rights. And these are people. They probably hated the gays, but they were like, we can make bank by opening these bars. So, I mean, it's kind of a love hate thing that I have. I mean, at least there was a bar, but at the same time, it's like the reason they existed. Mm. Anyway. Okay. It's in this climate that we get the Stonewall Inn. 
So it's located at 51 and 53 Christopher Street, and it's owned by the Genovese crime family. Three members of the mafia invest $3,500 each in 1966 to turn the Stonewall Inn. It was a restaurant at one point. It was a heterosexual disco at one point, And now it's a gay bar. Like, again, I love that they don't judge. They're just like, they see an opportunity. They're like, you know what? It's on Christopher Street. It's full of gays. They need a place to go. We can make bank on this. It's going to be a gay bar. So anyway, once a week, a cop would swing by and pick up an envelope of cash as a payoff, which they called a gayola. A gayola. The bar is a shithole. Anyway, there's no running water behind the bar. Um, used glasses are dunked into a tub of water, like used water. Like they're, they're just taking glasses off of tables and the bar top, and then they're just dunking it in this, reusing the same water, and then just wiping down the glasses, and then reusing them right away. Oh my God, COVID. Also, there's no fire exits, and the toilets overrun constantly. So, hot. It's a hot spot, though, for drug deals to go down, and literally the only place in the city where gays are allowed to dance. Like, can you imagine not dancing? That's our thing. Like, you go anywhere, and the first people on the dance floor are the gays. Uh, I wonder if we're making up for lost time. Hmm. Gay people were literally, it was illegal for gay people to dance together anywhere else except the Stonewall Inn at this time. So, if you were going out to the Stonewall Inn in 1969, this is how it would look like. So, you'd be met by a bouncer at the door, and he would check you out through a tiny peephole. Now, if you didn't look familiar or gay, then you were turned away to avoid undercover cops coming in. <laughs> okay. They called the undercover comps that came into gay bars to try to entrap them and stuff. They called them Lily Law or Alice Blue Gown or my personal favorite, Betty Badge. <laughs> I love that. Oh, so cute. Well, it's not cute. Sorry. Ooh, it was horrifying. Can you imagine? Can you imagine like you spend your whole week working hard and you're like, that's the weekend. Like here we're like, oh, it's the weekend. I'm going out. Woohoo. Well. I mean, COVID aside, I'm going out woohoo, and everything. And But they have to be like one eye on the door waiting for the place to be raided and for them to be arrested. Back to the Stonewall Inn. The drinking age is 18 years old. The entrance fee is $3 on weekends. And for that, you get two drink tickets. So as you come in, you need to sign a guest book, which somehow proves that the bar is a private bottle club. But no one signs their real name anyway, so I don't even know why they have it. Um, when you're inside, you see two dance floors. The walls are painted black, so it's pretty dark in there. And there's pulsing gel lights and black lights. I, I swear to God. Oh, my God. If anybody is listening to this podcast and they know the after-hour club called Spike that used to exist on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles, this is what I'm picturing basically it's going to be like. I mean, just black, dark, flashing lights just a fucking shithole and i spent many a night there so there you go so if a cop actually got into the club everyone knew that there was a cop there because this white light would come on and then everyone would stop whatever they were doing like making out or dancing anything anything because everything was illegal so you just had to kind of like fr basically just freeze in in position um, in the back of the bar is a small room where the queens hang out because even in a place like this it was even there it, it's segregated. So you would have, you know, like gay guys on the dance floor and then you would have the really feminine queen guys in another room because, oh, God forbid, we mingle. Um, the Stonewall Inn is one of only two bars in the city where femme guys can even go. Otherwise, they would be turned away from the other bars. And only a couple of men in full drag were allowed in on any given... Can you imagine? You get all decked out and you're like, I am going to the Stonewall Inn. And you get to the door and they're like, oh, sorry, Janice. We already have two uh, femme queens in here right now. So, hey, listen, if one leaves, you're, you're next on the list, okay? Like, fuck off. The customers are 98% guys with a few lesbians sprinkled in here and there. Okay, so the bar is pretty well known for having young homeless guys trying to sneak in so that they can have customers buy them drinks. All races are represented, and since the bar is central in the neighborhood and allows dancing... I mean, it's not a surprise. It becomes known as the gay bar in the city. Even though the mafia protected its cash cow as best they could, raids were still frequent, happening about once a month. 
Cops were looking for lewd behavior and places serving booze with, without a license, so bars kept extra liquor in hidden spots around the bars and in cars parked down the street. So if the police came and they were like, what are you doing? You're selling booze. You, you don't have a license. And they would be like, oh, no. Oh, gosh, they took our booze. <laughs> then they would open like a secret cabinet behind the bar or they would run down the street to like a you know, like a station wagon (laughs) that had like a bunch of extra booze and they would like truck that booze into the, into the bar. I mean, you really had to get crafty. I mean, like I said, going out is supposed to be fun and here you need to be on guard all the time. Raids are so frequent that bar managers usually know it's coming thanks to police tip-offs and they happen early enough in the night that it doesn't actually screw up business too, too much. So raids look something like this. All the lights would come on in a bar, and then customers are lined up, and they're asked to have their ID ready. People that don't have ID or those that are dressed in full drag are arrested immediately. Women had to be wearing... Oh, God. This... I can't get over this. Women had to be wearing three pieces of feminine clothing, and if they didn't have them, they would be arrested. So, what the fuck is feminine clothing? Like, so, if you have a skirt, a bra, and stockings then you're good. And and I love that. Who came up with this rule? Women had to be wearing three pieces of feminine clothes. Like, not two, not four, three. Three is the magic number. And I'm thinking like, I feel like there's a lot of room for interpretation there. Like, does a button-down shirt with a delicate floral pattern count as a feminine piece or not? Like, I don't know where that line is. Employees and management could also be arrested at any time, so it's very dicey to be working at any of these places. Which brings us to June 1969. During this time, they were seeing more raids than usual, and popular hangouts like the Checkerboard, the Telestar, and two others in Greenwich Village are forced to close. Then, the Tuesday before the uprising at Stonewall... The Stonewall Inn is raided once again. Tensions are high. The community is at a boiling point. They've been treated like dirt, arrested for no reason, and they're harassed to no end. A breaking point is coming. Can you feel it? And to top it off, the police stop getting their kickbacks from the mafia since most of the money they were taking from the bar isn't coming from liquor sales, but from blackmailing wealthy customers. So listen to this. The mafia owns the gay bar wealthy gays that work in the financial district would come to the bars the mafia would be able to single these people out and they would blackmail those wealthy guys basically saying well we'll tell everyone you're gay if you don't give us money they made most of their money blackmailing wealthy gays more money there well, I guess that's not a big surprise then because their booze kept getting stolen and there's a lot of homeless people and they don't have a lot of money to buy booze. So blackmailing the wealthy gays was, you know, the main source of income. So the cops stopped getting the kickbacks from the mafia because the mafia is getting most of their money from blackmailing and whatever. I guess it didn't wash that way. So the cops are like, fuck you. We're going to close the Stonewall in permanently. Which brings us to the night of June 28th, 1969. Let's say it again. June 28th, 1969 is an important date. And this is what happened. Two undercover male cops, two undercover female cops invade the bar on a mission to arrest as many people as possible and close the place for good. You have to remember, this is a place that some people, this was their only home. They were homeless. They had nothing, nowhere, nothing. They had nothing. They already had nothing. And the police were there to take away the one thing that wasn't even theirs. Sometimes they would sneak in and have people buy them drinks and stuff. And it's all they had. And they're going to have that taken away from them. So, The police are there to get visual evidence to report back to the public morals squad. I mean, the public morals squad. The fact that there's a public morals squad. I mean, that's the last thing. If there's something I do not resonate with. uh, You know how there's things you vibe with and things that just put you off completely? This is one of them. It's called the public morals squad. First of all, who are you to tell me what morals are? 
it, it, you're going to speak for the entire public and impose what you've decided are your morals on the rest of us? Why am I getting so upset about this? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I hit a nerve there. Okay. I, I, sorry, that was an unexpected rant. Um, <laughs> okay. Anyway, the public moral squad are waiting outside. Like, fuck you. Anyway, apparently there was a rumor of a raid set for that night. But since this raid was happening a lot later than previous raids had happened at the Stonewall Inn, people assumed that it was a false alarm. So they were going about their business and doing their things. But it wasn't a false alarm because at 1.20 a.m., four plainclothes police officers, like I mentioned, two males, two females, they're joined by two patrol officers in uniform, a detective and a deputy inspector who appear in the Stonewall Inn's double door entrance. And they announce, quote, police were taking the place. The music goes off. The lights come on. There are about 205 people in the bar when this happens. Those patrons that were used to the raids started to run for the doors and windows in the bathrooms because they don't want to be anything. They don't want to be arrested. They don't want to be part of this. But all of the entrances and exits are blocked by police. Those who have never been part of a raid before are standing there. They're completely stunned and they're wondering what the fuck is going on. Things start happening fast and the customers are told to line up and to get their ID out. In a typical raid, patrons would be lined up and their ID would be checked, like I just mentioned. Female officers would take customers dressed as women to the bathroom to verify their gender. Can you imagine how demeaning that would be, whether or not you're a woman? To have a, wo a female officer take you into the bathroom and tell you to pull out your pants to see if you had a penis or not. And if you did have a penis, you would be arrested. I can't. Handle it. I mean, just reading this is infuriating. I, I can't imagine living it. That's usually how it happened. But tonight, that's not how it was going to go down, bitches. Because tonight, those people that were dressed as women who had male genitalia refused to go to the bathroom with the police. Male officers were assaulting lesbians by frisking them inappropriately. People in line refused to show their ID, so the police decide to bring in everyone to the station. I mean, that's not realistic. But anyway, that's what they said they were going to do. That is, of course, after separating those people dressed as women into a back room. So still, they're segregating the, like, gay men and then the men that are dressed as women or who are presenting as female. There's a woman there, Maria Ritter. She's a trans woman who was there that night and whose family didn't know that she identified as a woman. And she recalls, quote, My biggest fear was that I would get arrested. My second biggest fear was that my picture would be in the newspaper or on a television report in my mother's dress. I mean, these are people that basically, you know, are not out to their families. And they're scared to death that people that they know and love would find out who they really were and then reject them. Another customer who was there that night says, quote, When did you ever see a fag fight back? Now, times were changing. Tuesday night was the last night for bullshit. Predominantly, the theme was, this shit has got to stop. Now, the police were supposed to take all the booze from the bar and patrol wagons, but the wagons weren't there yet, so everyone there is forced to wait over 15 minutes in line. And I think that while people were waiting, that's when everything started to stew and the fever broke. Because... Usually, those who are not arrested, they leave quickly and disappear into the night because they don't want anything to do with this, right? But not tonight, bitches. Tonight, those who were let go stick around outside, and soon the crowd outside of the Stonewall Inn grows to 150 people. Some had come from inside the bar. Others were now stopping because they were just walking by, and they're like, well, what's going on here? Everyone was talking about what was happening inside, and the tension grows. Growing in numbers and confidence, those who are left out, salute the cops ironically, and are cheered on by a growing crowd. By now, the crowd of people is 10 times the size of those being arrested, and the police, well, they can't help but notice that they're outnumbered. Police arrest some mafia members and employees of the bar with bystanders yelling gay power and singing We Shall Overcome, which I YouTubed. It's sung by Joan Baez, and it is, I mean, as I'm reading this, you can imagine the scene. I mean, just people yelling and shouting and starting to push and shove and sort of anger and tension and, you know, a push and a pull of this crowd. And then this song that apparently people were singing called We Shall Overcome is so calm and gentle. And it's such a beautiful song. 
and it's really a juxtaposition against the the screaming and the struggling and the violence that was happening around them. So anyway, you should YouTube it. Joan Baez, and it's called We Shall Overcome. It's really pretty. So we're there. There's a push and pull in the crowd, the growing anger, the final straw, frustration, the the abuses by the police. Like when one cop shoves a crossdresser, the crowd boos loudly, and she responds by whacking the cop over the head with her purse. So action, reaction. Rumors about people inside the bar being beaten circulate throughout the crowd, and they start hurling pennies and then beer bottles at the cop cars. One person they choose to arrest inside the Stonewall Inn is named Stormy de la Verie. That's a hard name to say, and I can speak French. De la Verie. Ooh. She's a biracial lesbian, also known as the guardian of lesbians in the village. Stormy was not known to cower to police, and when police slap the handcuffs on her wrist, the spark is lit for a night of resistance. Cops push her through the crowd towards the front door where a waiting police car stood ready to take her downtown. But she fights back and gets free, not once, but not twice, but several times. And she fights at least four cops who are on top of her. She's swearing and she's shouting for over 10 minutes. She tells them her handcuffs are too tight. The cops bash her on the head with a baton. and She's now bleeding from the head. She continues to fight back. The onlookers in the bar are watching in horror. And then it happens. Stormy looks at the crowd, and she yells, Why don't you guys do something? As an officer throws her into the back of the cop car, the crowd becomes a mob, and the mob goes nuts. It's in that moment that the tides turn, and the crowd overpower the police. What happened over the next week in Greenwich Village has since been called the Stonewall Riots, but Stormy is very clear that the word riot is misleading, saying, Quote, it was a rebellion. It was an uprising. It was a civil rights disobedience. It wasn't no damn riot. Cop cars are being wrecked by the crowd, overturned with slashed tires. Obviously, the commotion is attracting more and more people to the scene. And when it's learned that the police are raiding the bar because the mafia stopped paying them, the crowd starts throwing pennies, like I mentioned earlier, at the cops saying, quote, let's pay them off. Others yell pigs. Others yell faggot cops. Nearby is a construction site in a stack of bricks. Now, there's a lot of talk about who threw the first punch or who threw the first brick and even a story about our girl Marsha being in the bar when this was happening and throwing a shot glass against a mirror and yelling, I want my civil rights. But most of these stories have been exaggerated or altered with time. The point is, the police were there to arrest and close the place down, and a group of people started to fight back with the encouragement of Stormy and several other lesbians as she was being arrested. The police are severely outnumbered, obviously by this point, with the crowd having grown to 600 people or more. Multiple accounts of the riot assert that there was no pre-existing organization or apparent cause for the demonstration, and that what ensued was spontaneous. Michael Fader, who was there, explained, it wasn't anything tangible anybody said to anybody else. It was just kind of like everything over the years had come to a head on that one particular night in that one particular place, and it was not an organized demonstration. Everyone in the crowd felt that we were never going to go back. It was the last straw. It was time to reclaim something that had always been taken from us. All kinds of people, all different reasons, but mostly... It was total outrage, anger, sorrow, everything combined, and everything just ran its course. It was the police who were doing most of the destruction. We were really trying to get back in and break free, and we felt that we had freedom at last, or freedom at least to show that we demanded the freedom. We weren't going to be walking meekly into the night and letting them shove us around. It's like standing your ground for the first time and in a really strong way, and that's what caught the police by surprise. There was something in the air, freedom, a long time overdue, and we're going to fight for it. It took different forms, but the bottom line was, we weren't going to go away, and we didn't. Also, the Mattachine Society, remember they're the gay rights organization? Well, in their newsletter, they said this about why people fought back that night. Quote, it catered largely to a group of people who are not welcome in or couldn't afford other places of homosexual social gathering. The stone wall became home to these kids. When it was raided, they fought for it. That and the fact that they had nothing to lose other than the most tolerant and broad-minded gay place in town. 
And as the clash between police and the surging crowd continues, our girl Marsha hears what's going on, and she goes uptown to get her friend, Sylvia Rivera, who's sleeping on a park bench. They show up at around 2 a.m. to a mob scene, and the Stonewall Inn is literally on fire. There's garbage cans, garbage, bottles, rocks. Bricks are hurled at the building, breaking the windows and uprooting a parking meter to use it as a battering ram to smash in the doors of the Stonewall Inn, which, incidentally, are barricaded by the police who are cowering inside. Witnesses say that, quote, flame queens, hustlers, and gay street kids were the instigators throwing the projectiles because, frankly, they had nothing to lose. The cops were destroying the only place they had to go. Sylvia Rivera, also a huge name to know and remember from this story, says, quote, you've been treating us like shit all these years. Uh Uh-huh. Now it's our turn. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. The tactical patrol force of the NYPD arrived to free the officers who have barricaded themselves inside the bar for safety. The cops, by now, are humiliated. (laughs) Never had the gays stood up to them in this way. They weren't ready for it, and they weren't expecting it, and they certainly couldn't handle it. No one had ever made the cops retreat before. According to one witness said of the night, quote, All I could see about who was fighting was that it was transvestites and they were fighting furiously. The patrol force, which is the police, formed a line and marched slowly towards the crowd trying to push them back. But the crowd, and this part has actually been debated as to whether or not it's true, but I want to believe it's true because it's fun. The crowd form a kick line and they start singing, We are the Stonewall Girls. We wear our hair in curls. We don't wear underwear. We show our pubic hair. I mean, I really, really want to believe that this is true. Like a bunch of gays formed a a um, kicking, a chorus line, high kicking and singing and dancing <laughs> as, like, as the police are coming towards them. Come on, that has to be true. Another account stated, quote, I just can't get that one side out of my mind. The cops with the nightsticks and the kick line on one side. It was the most amazing thing and it's... And all of a sudden, that kick line, which I guess was a spoof of the machismo, I think that's when I felt rage, because people were getting smashed with bats, and for what? A kick line? So, I mean, that's a quote. Somebody said that, so I guess it was. The kick line is true. I'm going to believe that the kick line is true. By 4 a.m., the streets have become quieter now, but people are still lingering around. They're sitting in stoops. They chat in doorways. And there's a general debrief on the drama and the hell that just went down. No one had planned for this to happen, but collectively they all knew that it had to. As the dust settled, electricity still hangs in the air as the sky begins to brighten on a new day on Christopher Street, their street, our street. 13 people are arrested that night, some are hospitalized, and four police officers are injured. As for the Stonewall Inn, it's demolished. Payphones, toilets, mirrors, jukeboxes, cigarette machines, all smashed to pieces in the commotion of the night. Those who weren't there that night quickly learn about what went down at the Stonewall Inn. Rumors start flying around that it was students of the Democratic Society that started the fight. Others say it was the Black Panthers. And because history is important, and because we like to learn here at True Gay Crime, the Black Panther Party was an African-American revolutionary organization formed in 1966. Its initial purpose was to patrol black neighborhoods to protect residents from police brutality. Wow. Plus ça change. The next day after the uprising, throngs of people stood outside the Stonewall Inn staring at the charred building, their home destroyed. Graffiti on the building reads drag power they invaded our rights support gay power and legalize gay bars the next night the uprising continues but this time the queers are joined by police provocateurs curious bystanders and even tourists police provocateurs are just basically people that are like fuck the pigs or um down with the patriarchy or um you know anybody who hates anybody who's in charge basically was getting involved because they're like moths to a flame. They're like, oh my God, you guys are rebelling against, you know, the status quo. Awesome. I'm there. Um, so that went on the next night. And maybe the most remarkable thing that happened was probably the complete 180 degrees of a people who once hid underground. One witness said, quote, from going to places where you had to knock on a door and speak to someone through a peephole in order to get in, we were just out. We were in the streets. 5,000 leaflets are printed and distributed in the neighborhood that day that read, 
quote, get the mafia and the cops out of gay bars. The leaflet goes on to say that gays should own their own establishments for boycotts of places run by the mafia and demanding the local governments take them seriously. That night, thousands of people gather out front of the stone wall, which apparently was open, but I don't think that can be possible. It was destroyed. But I read somewhere that it was open. Anyway, regardless, there's tons of people outside. The crowds are spilling into the adjoining streets, harassing anyone who went by unless and until that they would admit that they supported gays. <laughs> can you imagine you're just out walking your dog and then you have a bunch of people like, do you support gays? And you're like, oh God, I'm just walking my dog. Do you like us? Do you support us? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Okay, good. You can go. Thank you. Oh God. <laughs> um, our girl, Marsha, she shows up on the second night, too. She is super fired up from the night before and empowered from having had time to digest basically what had happened. She, along with Zazanova and Jackie Hormona, who are three individuals that are known to have been on the vanguard of the pushback, Marsha climbs a lamppost and drops a bag with bricks on it under a cop car and it smashes the windshield. Fires are started in trash cans and more than 100 police show up. Then, after 2 a.m., there's kick lines and police chase. <laughs> Sorry. Are there more kick lines? I love it. Oh my god. Okay, the next time this is great. The next time somebody's up in your grill, oh, but I guess you have to be with a, at least one other person to do a kick line. You can't do it by yourself, can you? I don't know, that would be funny. Somebody's up in your grill and they're giving you like the business and they're pissing you off, and then you just start doing like a chorus line right in front of them. Da, 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 like a Moulin Rouge. Oh my god. Police are capturing people, but the crowd would steal them back, and the street is ablaze until 4 a.m. Also that night, Allen Ginsberg, one of the beat poets that we mentioned earlier, who happened to live on Christopher... I mean, how could you live on Christopher Street and not be a part of what's going on? I mean, you'd have to be. I mean, you're in it. It's your street. It's right there. It's right in your face. Um, he learned about the night's events, and he decides to check it out, obviously. He's reported as saying... Quote, gay power, isn't that great? It's about time we did something to assert ourselves. And he visits the open Stonewall Inn for the first time. Again, they're saying it's open. How can it be open? I mean, it just must have been charred and falling apart. But there's like a couple beers and they're just like, just come in and hang out. Maybe it was more like that, I think. But not everyone in the community is happy about what happened on June 28th. Older members of the gay community and members of the Mattachine Society felt like all the work that they had done to prove to heterosexuals that gays are no different than them and that gays weren't just a bunch of drag queens causing a scene, being tacky and cheap, well, they felt that that was all being undone. They abhorred the effeminate behavior on display and they hated bringing attention to it. I, I do respect their point of view because they were coming from a different time. And they paved the way for the Stonewall Uprising to happen. They were doing the best they could with what they had. And back in those days, in their days, in the 30s, the 40s, and 50s, it was better to assimilate and to try to fit in so that you could be side by side with. But it had come to a point where that wasn't enough and the rights and privileges weren't being given for the assimilation. So I'm not going to assimilate anymore. I'm going to put on my flower crown and walk around in my red plastic pumps, give you the middle finger, and fight back. And that's what they did. These brave, downtrodden souls who fought back on June 28th couldn't fit in anyways, even if they wanted to, either because of the color of their skin or because of the sheer nature of who they were. You know, it's not your job to make other people's existence comfortable. And in fact, you're doing yourself and them a disservice by trying to blend in and by dimming your light. Wednesday after the event, the Village Voice runs a report of the, quote, riots that are really harsh to the participants. Now, the Village Voice is like basically a gay newspaper. They never use the word gay, but it's the gay newspaper for the Greenwich Village. It's the Village Voice, right? We've talked about it a few times on this podcast. They were really harsh to the participants, calling it, quote, forces of faggotry, limp wrists, and Sunday fag follies. Like, where's the support? I don't know. Maybe they didn't understand what was going on. Maybe they thought it was just a bunch of hooligans that were making a scene or something like that. But um, anyway, it's kind of sad because they could have used the good press from a fucking queer paper. But they didn't get that at that time. They will later, as you'll see. So in retaliation, a, a mob 
and not mob mafia, but just a mob, like a big crowd, descends on Christopher Street, threatening to burn down the village voice office. Like these people are feeling are feeling empowered. They're basically like, you know what? <laughs> we will take anyone on at this point, even our own kind, quote unquote. Um, the crowd is upwards of a thousand people and include other groups, minorities and the like who are curious how the gays defeated the police. So now they really have the attention of the city. Wednesday night is another night of violence with injuries and shops being looted. One witness says, quote, the word is out. Christopher Street shall be liberated. The fags have had it with oppression. Craig Rodwell, a member of the Mattachine Society and who would travel down to Philly to pick it quietly in front of Independence Hall, which is how they did it back then. They were very subdued and they would fit in and just be like, hey, I'm just like you. Look, whatever. Anyway, this Chad Rodwell, he's like, it's time to stop picking quietly. He makes it one of his first priorities to plan Christopher Street Liberation Day. Gone were the days of the polite Mattachine Society and in its wake is born the Gay Liberation Front or GLF the first of its kind to use the word gay in its name. Every other gay organization before that didn't use the word gay because they didn't want to draw attention to that, even though they had a gay focus to it or their mantra or motto or raison d'être was, you know, to get gay rights. So joining the GLF was another group called the Gay Activist Alliance or GAA. Their motto was, quote, we as liberated homosexual activists demand the freedom for expression of our dignity and value as human beings. Six months after the uprising, a newspaper called Gay is born. I mean, like, only six months after. Like, this was ready to bust. Like, all of this stuff is born after this. Then within two weeks, there's two more, one called Come Out and another one called Gay Power. But there was still a lot of work to do. Raids on the bars continue, as do the arrests. So, out of the ashes of the night rises what we know today globally as the Pride Festival. It's now exactly one year after the uprising. It's June 28th, 1970. And to mark the occasion, the Christopher Street Liberation Day is born with queer people of all stripes gathering on Christopher Street. To show solidarity, there are also marches in Los Angeles and Chicago. These would mark the first ever in U.S. history. One year later... And the thing goes global, with marches in Boston, Dallas, Milwaukee, London, Paris, West Berlin, and Stockholm. Marchers get their permit only hours before the scheduled beginning of the event, but it goes relatively smoothly, with little harassment from onlookers. Perhaps trying to make up for their terrible reporting a year earlier that basically looked down on the gays, the Village Voice runs a positive article saying, quote, the outfront resistance that grew out of the police raid on the Stonewall Inn one year ago. A year after that, in 1972, Atlanta, Buffalo, Detroit, Washington, D.C., Miami, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, and San Francisco joined the party. Many new activists consider the Stonewall Uprising the birth of the gay liberation movement. Certainly, it was the birth of gay pride on a massive scale. Even though there were uprisings before Stonewall, the reason Stonewall was so significant was that thousands of people were involved. The riot lasted a long time, six days, and it was the first to get major media coverage, and it sparked the formation of many gay rights groups. Which brings us back to our girl, Marsha P. Johnson. After the uprising, Girlfriend joins the Gay Liberation Front and is very active in the Drag Queen Caucus. She marches in the very first Gay Pride Rally, then it was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day Rally, which I just mentioned, a year after the Stonewall Uprising. She takes place in sit-ins and protests on behalf of the Gay Liberation Front, but she also starts her own movement, get this, with her good friend, whom we met earlier, Sylvia Rivera. These two are fascinating. The two of them start the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR for short, and the group becomes a notable presence at gay liberation marches. But get this, and talk about being on the fringe of the fringe. In 1973, the organizers of the Pride Rally, they ban Marsha and Sylvia from participating in the Pride Parade because, quote, weren't going to allow drag queens at their marches claiming they were giving them a bad name. This goes back to like the older gays in the Mattachine Society from earlier, and they were hating the fact that Stonewall even happened because they didn't want to rock the boat. But you have to, otherwise nothing changes. So it's funny that this is 1973. So the first one was in 1970. So we're only three years on, and already the organizers of the Pride Rally 
are banning certain members of the community, namely Marsha and Sylvia, because they don't want the outside outside people to associate gays with these loud, outspoken trans women, which is so sad. Like you, you just this just have you just got this this visibility, and I I guess I mean. Okay, playing devil's advocate, they're thinking we just got this visibility. We don't want to fuck it up. If we put these people in the front, it's going to put people off, and then they're just going to go on hating us and ostracizing us. If we hide them in the back or just ban them from the parade, maybe we can get our rights together first, and maybe down the road, people like Marsha and Sylvia can be part of the parade. Wow, that was devil's advocate for you. We all do the best we can with what we have. So, anyway, they're banned, and guess what our girls do? They place themselves at the very front of the march, and they go ahead of everybody else. So, basically, this group of trans women are leading the parade. They were banned from the parade, and now they're leading the parade. So, back to Star House. Now, you have to keep in mind, Marsha and Sylvia have, like, no money at all. And they're total outcast. They're the outcasts of the outcasts. And the fact that they can get this much done is just astonishing. So they create Star House that I mentioned before. It's a shelter for gay and trans street kids. They pay for the rent on the shelter with the money that they make from sex work. I mean, they barely are scraping by for themselves and they're taking care of everyone else. Marsha becomes the drag mother of the Star House in the tradition of having a chosen family in the LGBTQ2 plus community. As mother of the house, Marsha provides food, shelter, clothes, emotional support, and a sense of family for the drag queens, trans women, gender nonconformists, and other gay street kids. But it's not all good for Marsha. In the 1970s, she suffers from mental health issues. And since we didn't talk about those things back then, and because who she was and what she represented, it's not a surprise that she doesn't get the help that she really needs. However, she does visit psychiatric institutions on a regular basis, trying to address and cope with her ups and downs. The thing that keeps her going, the activism. Now it's the dawn of a new decade in the 1980s, and we see Marsha solidify her status as an important figure in the fight for equal rights when she rides in the front car of the New York City annual Gay Pride Parade. She continues her street activism as organizer and marshal with ACT UP, which, if you don't know, ACT UP stands for... AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. It's an international grassroots political group working to end the AIDS pandemic. The group works to improve the lives of people with AIDS through direct action, medical research, treatment, and advocacy, and working to change legislation and public policies. And their motto? Silence equals death. Marsha famously is quoted as saying, quote, how many years does it take for people to see that we're all brothers and sisters and human beings in the human race? I mean, how many years does it take for people to see that we're all in this rat race together? I wish I had an answer for you, Marsha. In the 1980s, she moves in with her good friend, Randy Wicker, who helps the mother that helped everyone else. And in the early 90s, Marsha says, quote, They call me a legend in my own time because there were so many queens gone and I'm one of the few queens left from the 70s and the 80s. But for Marsha, time was running out. And in 1992, she reveals that she's HIV positive and she has been for the last two years. But even before AIDS has a chance to claim her life, that same year, right after the 1992 Pride Parade, her body is found floating in the Hudson River. Police call it a suicide, but friends that know her know that she would never do that. And of course, suicide doesn't explain the massive wound on the back of her head. The death is obviously suspicious. And while she did suffer from mental health issues, they never manifested as suicidal. Randy Wicker, her friend and housemate for the last decade of her life, says she may have hallucinated and thrown herself into the river, or, more likely, she jumped into the river to escape someone or a gang of harassers, but she was definitely not suicidal. Backing up Randy's suspicions of having been harassed, several witnesses come forward to say they saw Marsha chased by a group of thugs, and Randy says a witness saw Marsha fighting with a neighborhood resident who was screaming homophobic slurs at her. The same resident is later in a bar bragging that he killed a drag queen named Marsha. I mean... If that story is true, then you have your answer. I mean, I don't know if that's gossip or rumor. 
But I mean, somebody's bragging about killing a drag queen named Marsha. It's pretty obvious it's not a suicide. The person who witnessed the confrontation goes to the police, but they ignore the information. Not surprisingly, law enforcement wasn't interested in investigating Marsha's death, even saying that the case was about a, quote, black gay man and didn't want anything to do with it. So filmmaker David France would later make a Netflix documentary, which I spoke about at the top of this podcast. And he says, quote, the most likely understanding of what happened to her that night is she fell into the river because she was chased there by the police themselves. So this idea of police violence going unanswered has a long history, especially within the queer community, but the community of color across the board. Marsha is cremated and her ashes are released over the river. Years later, in 2002, a police investigation resulted in reclassification of Johnson's cause of death from suicide to undetermined. And in 2012, the case is reopened as a possible homicide. And then in 2016, Victoria Cruz of the Anti-Violence Project opens the case again and gets access to previously unreleased documents and witness statements. She gets new interviews and witnesses, friends, activists, and even the police that were involved in the case at the time of her probable murder. Victoria Cruz can also be found on the Netflix documentary. And today, Marsha's name and legacy lives in the Marsha P. Johnson Institute, which protects and defends the human rights of black transgender people. On February 1st of this year, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York announced that East River Park in Brooklyn would be renamed in Johnson's honor. It's the first LGBTQ2 plus person to have a New York State Park. New York State Park? <laughs> I'm going to name my dinner after you. It's the first person to have a New York State Park named after them. The Marsha P. Johnson State Park will also have a statue created in honor of Marsha to be unveiled this year, which is the information that I got. But then I went online and I believe it's a fountain, which I think is a lot more beautiful. Uh, When I was in London, I saw a similar fountain in honor of Diana, Princess of Wales, And I thought that a fountain was beautiful because it's water and it's flowing and it's water is life and it has movement. A a statue is a little bit stoic and creepy and stilted and but a fountain is water. It's life. It's movement. It's beauty. It's alive. I feel like it's that's a more beautiful thing. So I believe that it's actually a fountain that they did. I'm going to close with a quote from Donald Bell of Chicago. He's a former college dean, and he says the Stonewall called attention to a group of who lacked basic civil rights. Quote, that's why Marsha's visibility and advocacy remain important. She and a number of others who lived at the intersection between racism and homophobia were political agitators that helped advance the mindset of society. And at this point, I usually say, and so ends the story of blah, blah, blah. But in this case, the story continues because Marsha's story and experience lives on today. She represents so many faces that go unnoticed or worse are harassed endlessly every day. It's easy to look away. It's hard to look right at it, but it's there staring at us in the face. The injustice, the lack of basic human rights that people in our community face around the world. Let's not forget, it took the NYPD 50 years to apologize for what happened on June 28th, 1969. And in most parts of the world, they haven't even reached their Stonewall moment yet. So the story isn't over. Marsha lives on in all of us as we carry on with speaking up and speaking out for ourselves And for those who can't speak for themselves, let's get uncomfortable. Let's be seen. Let's be heard. Because silence equals death. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com, and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, 
lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?